Prosperity is more than a number. It's the power to shape what's possible for you, your family, and your heirs. Here, you'll find ideas for building wealth, safeguarding it, and translating it into true prosperity with insight from actual business owners and financial professionals. Welcome to the FDP Prosperity Report, hosted by your Chief Prosperity Officer, Mark Chandick. I'm Mark Chandick. Welcome to this edition of the Prosperity Podcast. I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Michael McClary. He's Chief Investment Officer for the TOPS Portfolios at Valmark Financial Group. Mike has direct responsibility for the investment programs for Valmark Advisors Incorporated and Valmark Institutional, representing over $7.5 billion in assets. He's one of only three employee shareholders of Valmark Financial Group. TOPS is one of the nation's longest running, largest and most successful exchange traded fund investment management programs ever. Michael's particular area of expertise include portfolio management, ETFs, capital markets, and derivatives. Mike has a Bachelor of Science, Business Administration degree, and also an MBA, both from the University of Akron. I'd like to welcome my guest, Michael McClary. Good afternoon, Mark. I think our talk is timely given what's going on, what's going on in world markets. So let's just dive in, won't we? Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about your role and your background uh, in investing in general? Well, sure. And uh, it's great to be on this. I mean, we've had a, a long relationship both with you, Mark, and with FDP, and uh, always had a ton of respect for the work that you do and, and, the, and the great financial planning and uh, work that you do with your investors. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big key to describe how I do my job is um, I do the work behind the screen where we're managing the portfolios and uh, monitoring portfolios, monitoring markets and making uh, those primary investment decisions for investors. Uh, as you mentioned, I do that for about seven and a half billion dollars in assets. I've been in my role for almost 20 years. I run a team of um, four of us that uh, are very well accredited and we meet uh, at least weekly to, uh, to oversee the portfolios and then we're obviously doing stuff throughout the day as well. So that's, you know, a key to my role is I'm, I'm in there each day, Mark, monitoring the markets, writing about markets, uh, making investment decisions and helping to run a team of, of, of really smart people that I'm fortunate to have behind me. Great. Thanks for sharing that. What are some of your fundamental investment philosophies that we should know about? Well, I, I get asked the question a lot about, you know, you've got a lot of responsibility. How do you sleep at night and how do you, you deal with all this? And I think a couple of things drive that. Um, one of which is having a, a really sound process. So when I look at how we manage portfolios, it's a very disciplined process. It's a proven process. Uh, much of it we've been running to some degree for 20 years. I've been fine tuning it, uh, looking for outside feedback, uh, constant advice and, and input from outside and, in, and internal sources as well. So I'd say that first and something I've learned and fortunately learned early in my career was to, to implement that discipline. Secondly, uh, risk management. I was saying that I never mentioned return without mentioning risk in the same sentence. And that gives you a summary of how I approach investment management. Uh, you might go to a cocktail party and somebody says, hey, I got a 5% return yesterday or a 20% return last week in this stock or that stock. And you, know, you may respond and say, hey, great, but how much risk did you take to get there? And uh, my mind automatically goes to that. And I think that that feeds into um, a lot of things that kind of run uh, decisions for us. Uh, a third piece would be indexing. And uh, we'll show a, a slide here real quickly that kind of just gives you an example of one study that I've been using for um, 20 years. And, and even before that, when I was doing research in graduate school, and this, this slide shows the S&P index versus active report, uh, which highlights how actively managed mutual fund portfolios have performed as opposed to their benchmark indexes. And we can see over the last 20 years here that on average, about 90% of the time, sometimes over 90% of the time, those active managers fail to outperform their indexes. Mm -hmm. So a key to my investment philosophy, Mark, is putting myself in that 90th percentile, putting myself in that top 10, hopefully, in each of my asset classes that we run by using index investments. And fortunately, we were early in the curve on this, and, and we were one of the, as you mentioned, one of the longest running uh, ETF portfolio managers in the country, uh, ETFs tracking indexes. Um, but this is catching on significantly. 
just in the last 10 years, we've seen $3 trillion roughly come out of actively managed mutual funds and about $3 trillion go into indexes and ETFs. We're also seeing this be the fundamental investment strategy for many large institutions uh, where they're uh, dismissing uh, trying to outperform that index with an expensive active manager and instead using indexes and ETFs. Um, as I mentioned, ETFs being the fourth, you know, go from indexing number three to ETFs number four. And in the ETF world, we've got a significant amount of expertise. Uh, when I started, there was about 130 ETFs available. Now there's thousands. So we were fortunate. I always say I was there at the birth of pretty much every ETF out there. Mm. And not only do we understand them, we're one of the larger traders of ETFs in the country. And we also uh, have designed our own and, uh, and been able to uh, really get into the nitty gritty of how they work. Um, and lastly uh, is derivatives. Uh, if you look at how we put together portfolios, again, mentioning risk, we have, like the opportunity to use derivatives, whether it be futures or options contracts, to help control the risk of the underlying ETFs and indexes that we're using. Uh, we launched a program in 2010 uh, using futures contracts. We predominantly uh, work with the 22 life insurance companies that have chosen us as their ETF portfolio manager. And for those insurance companies and the investors that they serve, we will use futures contracts to dial up risk and return uh, in the different portfolios that we run. That style of investing we helped to start has now ballooned into over $200 billion across the industry in, in that style. And we were one of the first to do that. And just within the last few years, we've implemented some pretty sophisticated option strategies where we are now using options to control risk on an annual basis in the contracts. So that gives you a little bit of a background of kind of my fundamental philosophy coming from diversification, risk management, indexing ETFs, and, and into using derivatives for risk management. Fascinating, Mike, especially the, the uh, option strategy. We're going to learn more about that, I think, in a little bit. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit how you implement these strategies out in the marketplace? Well, as I mentioned, I want to give, I have a saying that my number one goal is to give clients statistically the best chance for success. And as I mentioned, I think indexes do that. They give me that opportunity to, to give my clients that, that statistical best chance for success. <clears throat> Within the indexes though, if I'm trying to pick an ETF that tracks an index, even if it's a large cap index, for example, there are many different flavors. And one of the things I always mention is that all the ETFs are not created equal. And I've spoken before, for example, at college courses or whatever, I've had a professor ask me to come in and I tell these students, I say, don't send me an email three months from, from now and say, hey, Mr. McClary, you know, you should be proud of me. I, I bought an ETF today. And I'll say, which, which ETF? Because, you know, there are some ways to hurt yourself out there. And that's where I think having a professional is, is really important. So I think that's key. And we, we use predominantly ETFs to implement these strategies, but we really want to make sure we're using the right ones. And we're getting into the, again, the nitty gritty about how these things work because little nuances can make a big difference. You could see in an annual basis, uh, two or three different ETFs all tracking purportedly small cap stocks that might have 10, 15, 20% difference in return in a single calendar year, hmm. even when a, a layman may believe that they're tracking the same thing. So I think that's something that's important and, and we implement those using ETFs, but it's about using the right ETFs. Um, I think another key to this is our investment process and our systematic monitoring. When my team gets together, you know, we have specific things we review each week and we have specific reports that we're looking at each day that help us to keep track of what's going on in the market and how that impacts our portfolios directly. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly important part. Another piece of implementation is rebalancing. You know, the simple concept of setting in place a target allocation each year. And then as the market drifts throughout the year, having that discipline to go in at least once a year and rebalance us back to our target allocations. You may have, for example, put in place a portfolio that was 50% stocks and 50% bonds 10 years ago. And if you haven't gone back and adjusted that, you could have a very different risk tolerance at this point. So we believe very strongly in, in utilizing rebalancing. Um, lastly, is strategic allocation changes. We do not believe in a full set it and forget it type of strategy. We are not, on the other side, we are not tactical. We're not reading investors' business daily over the weekend and getting in on Monday morning and going totally in or out of the market. We do not believe in that. Um, we have a systematic, very disciplined process, but we do believe in making some strategic changes and tweaks to the portfolio as time goes on. 
Uh, for example, in the last few years, we've made very you know, impactful changes to our fixed income or bond allocations. And as we entered the year this year, when interest rate risk really flared, and we saw many bond funds suffer, the changes that we made to reduce interest rate risk were very impactful and beneficial to our investors. So I think it's important to have somebody, Mark, who really understands, first of all, every building block they're using in a portfolio. Secondly, is using that disciplined process to make sure they're pruning and, and, and growing that portfolio over time. And, and, and then the insight to really uh, come together and, and a process to, to make those strategic allocation changes as necessary over time. Great, thank you for sharing that. I especially like the whole idea or notion around discipline. I think that's really important. We're in a very volatile market place right now on a global scale. Uh, what are some of the current issues impacting your portfolios uh, right now? Well, Mark, where do I begin? It's, uh, it is kind of an interesting time. Um, I've, I've been asked the question you know, about, you know, are markets acting weird right now? And you know, in some ways, again, looking back over the last two decades I've been doing this, in many ways, we're getting back to normal. Um, in one regard, if you look back over the last about 50 years, on average, we've seen the S&P 500 dip on average 14% at least once a year. So it's not uncommon for the market to have certain pullbacks throughout the year and then recover. Um, you know, it, it may or may not recover you know, before the end of this calendar year. We'll, you know, that only time will tell. But it's, it's, it's normal for the market to have these type of, of breathers. And so I'd say from that perspective, you know, we're, we're not outside the realm. Um, another thing that I think is important is you look at the overall environment, the last eight, nine, 10 years has been abnormal from an investing perspective in a few ways. One of which is we've had an abnormally low interest rate environment. And that's been artificially set by the Federal Reserve and other market forces and keeping interest rates very low. That's, that's abnormal. Also, inflation has been abnormally low. Um, and then on top of that, we've had abnormally high valuations of stocks. So, and then lastly, the Federal Reserve has been coming in pretty much every time the market has pulled back in the last 10 years and added some type of stimulus um, to really bail us out. They've thrown us a, a safety preserver. And that's, those environments are not normal. It's not a normal to have very low interest rates, low inflation, uh, high or above average valuations of stocks, and a, a Federal Reserve mother that's going to come in and, and save you every time you skin your knee. Mm -hmm. Now we're in an environment where interest rates are getting back to more of a normalization. Inflation has overstepped a bit. Um, I would say that is probably mm -hmm. the most abnormal thing about what we have now. It went from abnormally low to abnormally high, mm -hmm. which you know puts us in a unique situation. Mm -hmm. um, valuations of stocks have come back down, and many Many stocks, small cap, big cap, international emerging markets, many of these areas are trading at valuations lower than historical averages. So some may argue an attractive valuation. Um, and the Fed is not going to bail us out, at least in the short term. Um, you know, we, we, uh, they have other fish to fry. And, and that is you know, effectively stepping in to, to help with inflation. So the environment is much different. Now, to summarize kind of where I see things going and, and where we're at, I think this inflation workout is going to take a, a while. Um, if you look at uh, how inflation has reacted historically, typically would not recede uh, quickly. Um, you look at the tools that we're using, the Federal Reserve predominantly using their interest rate, uh, ability to change interest rates in the federal reserve funds rate. Uh, when they change a the federal funds rate, you typically do not see inflation go down that afternoon. It can take 12 months. It can take 18 months. So I think that's going to be very frustrating for markets. As, as we deal with this, that they're not going to get immediate feedback from the federal Fed funds rate increases. And that also this is going to take some time to work out and we're going to have to be disciplined. Something else that not everybody's talking about has been lost in the translation a little bit is China. China is obviously you know, one of the top economies in the world and about a quarter of the total population of China is living under lockdown right now, a forced mandate driven down by the communist government of China uh, due to the uh, surge in um, coronavirus in the country. And this is gonna be causing reverberations uh, in, the, uh, in the economy in China, more than likely pushing them into recession. And I think it's very difficult for that not to have 
a ripple effect throughout the worldwide economy. And that may be having a larger impact on stock prices right now than people are, are really uh, giving credit to. Um, another thing that I see is, you know, in relation to valuations, like I said, valuations on stocks are getting down below historical averages for many asset classes, which is fun. It, it gives us a great uh, springboard for future returns. But key to that is whether earnings can hang in there. As we've just finishing up our earnings season with over 90% of companies reporting in the S&P 500, we are seeing, uh, I believe it's about three quarters, a little over three quarters of companies are beating estimates that so far this quarter and what we've got in so far. So earnings have been coming in pretty good. As well as 2023 um, and late 2022 calendar year earnings estimates are at historical highs. So the idea is, is that companies at this point at least are able to pass along that inflation to investors and they're still very profitable. And actually their profit margins are at uh, over 20 year highs. So they're still making money. As long as the fuel, which is I call earnings the fuel, continues to be able to go into the, to the fuel tank and they can maintain their profit margins, I think it can support you know, current valuations and future valuations. So for long-term uh, investors, we're at a, a time when long-term investors, you know, I think should be in the market. When you look at overall valuations that they're sitting at, if you're gonna be in there for the next five to 10 years, I don't know why you would necessarily not be in the market now. Um, that being said, obviously we could see continued deterioration in stock prices in the short term. There's, there's no question that that can occur. And the market is very vulnerable right now uh, and for bad, for bad news. So if we do see bad news come about, you know, we could see these shocks. There's not a whole lot of, of power in the market right now. We have that vulnerability. But for longer term investors, I think, you know, if you hang in there, you're holding it at, at relatively attractive valuations and underlying economy is still relatively strong. The consumer is still buying a lot and, and we've, we've got relatively good earnings, Mark. You know, one subject that um, is uh, creating a lot of headlines revolves around fixed income, revolves around bonds. Specifically, I think it caught a lot of investors flat-footed because they realized, my goodness, I can actually lose money, uh, at least uh, from an accounting perspective on my, on my statement, uh, when I hold bonds. So clients are concerned about the rising interest rates and how it does impact, negatively impact their bond values. How are you dealing with this dynamic? Well, this has been something that's been a theme for me and a focus for me for at least a decade. Um, you know, being a macro level portfolio manager where I'm managing both equity investments and fixed income investments, uh, I have spent more than likely more time on the bond side and the fixed income side than I have on the equity side in the last 10 years. And because it's been so labor intensive to really monitor and watch what's going on and prepare for really what's happened here in the last uh, three to five months. And so what we've been doing, Mark, and is we moved our duration or our average maturity of our fixed income portfolio a little shorter. And by doing that, what it does is it reduces the interest rate risk. So if we remember as bond prices, excuse me, as interest rates increase, bond prices go down. The degree to which they go down is higher if you're holding longer term bonds or more interest rate sensitive bonds. So by us shortening our duration, shortening our uh, maturity of our bonds, we have reduced the impact that we ended up having from rising interest rates in the first quarter of this year and, and into the first part of the second quarter as well. Something else we do is we diversify heavily so that we're not standing there just taking that, that full uh, duration hit. And a big part of that is using TIPS bonds, for example. TIPS bonds are issued by the US government and they, they adjust their coupon rate based off the level of inflation. So inflation has been high, it's increased the coupon rate and TIPS bonds have performed relatively well in the last 12 months, especially versus other bonds. So that's been a tool we've used. We've also used investment grade floating rate bonds and there's different types of floating rate bonds. Again, it's one of those things I'm careful about because you might say, hey, Mr. McClary, I did great. I went on and bought some floating rate bonds. Well, not all floating rate bonds are, are considered equal, but we, we tend to use investment grade or the higher credit quality floating rate bonds. And what those do is they give you a higher level of interest as interest rates rise, and that helps you to not lose principal as, as interest rates rise. So by using these different tools, we perform very well uh, this so far this year in this rising interest rate environment. 
Uh, we do feel like we have a good strategy to work our way through kind of the middle innings of this, this interest rate rise and then a, a good long-term discipline to get back to a more uh, moderate duration level so that our investors in the long run can have, uh, can have higher interest rates. So if we're able to continue to, to work through this and I feel like we have a good strategy and we're, we're doing pretty well in the early innings, um, you know, I feel like we can, we can add some value for our investors in this, in this tough, tough interest rate environment. One of the very widely quoted stats that clients are reading is the one that says that in the last 40 years, there hasn't been a year in which stocks and bonds have both lost value. And um, of course, we're only four and a half months into the year, but uh, how, do you, how do you respond to that headline? Well, I think, Mark, that's a headline that was something that we saw again on the horizon and we've been preparing for. We recognize that that environment could occur and um, we prepared for it in both ways. We prepared for it in diversifying our equities. You know, some of the competitors um, overweight in large cap growth stocks. I've been writing for, I don't, you read my stuff. I mean, I don't know how many years I've been writing about large cap growth stocks being overvalued. And so people say, are you surprised the market pulled back? Well, I don't know. I've been saying that large cap growth stocks have been overvalued for a long time and that they were susceptible to this type of risk. And when it happened, they obviously retreated significantly. Um, so I think that it's that discipline of staying diversified that helped us to weather this relatively well. I think that the uh, on the fixed income side, again, it's that diversification and it's that uh, ability to try to uh, make lemonade out of lemons as, as best mm -hmm. as we can. Uh, but I think if we do have a year where, you know, where both of them are down, uh, hopefully slightly down if that, um, it's a year where you dust yourself off and you just get ready for the next year, frankly, Mark. And, and you, I think that investors also should be reminded of the incredible return environment we've had really in the last uh, five to 10 years and in recognizing that. And, um, and I also wouldn't get too tied up in calendar years. I think investors really, you know, spend too much time. I believe me, it's, it's, it's the uh, way of my life. You know, I'm tied to these, you know, returns and, and, and so long-term investors years, but, should let you do the worrying and you lose the sleep. I, they that's go about what I, their that's life. my job is. And I'm going to use processes to try to that's dissipate right. that as much as possible. Any parting thoughts uh, that you'd like to share at this time? Well, I, I think I would tell your investors, Mark, um, you know, a couple key things. Number one, make sure you have a plan. And I know if they work directly with you, they have a plan, but not everybody does. And, um, you know, there's, there's people that may just have never gotten around to doing that. And it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, not only do you need discipline in your portfolio, but you need discipline in your overall financial plan. And without a plan in and of itself, how can you even have any discipline? You have nothing to, to, to gauge against. And we have an incredible team uh, that works along with, uh, with FDP and Mark, a uh, team of chart, uh, certified financial planners that do this all day, every day, and, and do incredible analysis. Just, just a great team and a lot of experience and look at it from every different angle. So I would encourage people to look at having a plan uh, secondly, working with a trusted advisor and not all advisors are created equal as well. Uh, there's a lot of different varied uh, levels of experience and expertise. And I think it's important to, to work with advisors who have experience, who have, who understand different tools in the marketplace, have ability to be independent and, and use all types of different tools, whether they be investments. Uh, there are some scenarios where I can't replicate what an insurance company can provide because an insurance company can spread risk over millions of lives and that adds value. So somebody that really understands insurance products and investment products and really can be there as your partner as you go through these really difficult times. Um, managing money and the personal responsibility we have to be in charge of our, our own finances is a great gift. It's a freedom it's, it, and it's something to be, to be cherished, but it's also one heck of a responsibility, Mark. I bet, especially during these times. Yes. You know, I, I really uh, uh, like and resonate with the idea of goals-based investing, where your goals are driving the amount of risk that you take on and therefore what your expectation of reward is. It, it really is a, a terrific way to approach um, the long-term investment environment. We've come to an end of our time together, Mike, and I wanna thank you for your time uh, on a Friday afternoon from Akron, Ohio. And I wanna thank all of you for watching and listening to the most recent edition of Prosperity Podcast.
Thank you for tuning in to the Prosperity Report. If you enjoyed the episode, I want to offer you a free download of my latest book, 10 Financial Strategies for the Smart Investor. It's a candid view of where we go wrong with money and how to get back on track. In it, you'll discover how to avoid common mistakes and build lasting wealth. To get your free copy, first click the subscribe button you see on your screen. Then find the link in the show description below and click on that. Soon you'll be on the way to turning all your possibilities into true reality.